Greetings, Padawan. We are going to talk about Ralph Waldo Emerson's essay, Self-Reliance. And I apologize, my work computer constantly has things popping up in the corner, so I'll get rid of them as they show up. So, published first in 1841 uh, in a collection of essays, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson published Self-Reliance. He then um, he re-released it in 1847. And what's important about that and the difference between them is that when he first published Self-Reliance in 1841, there were three epitaphs, uh, the Latin here, uh, this uh, selection from a poem, and then he had his own epitaph. And then in his revised version, he took out his epitaph, the one that he wrote. And then um, in modern renditions of the essay, of uh, editors have put it back in. So that's just something, you know, to know. Um, this Latin phrase, which I, I am not great in uh, spoken Latin, I took Latin and I can read Latin, but I can't actually speak it, um, means, translated, um, it means do not seek outside thyself. So do not seek outside of yourself. Um, and that is what this whole work is about. This entire work, if we look at it as a whole, is about being self-reliant. Emerson looked around at the world around him. He felt there was a lot of conformity, a lot of um, relying on others to determine what was right or wrong or good or bad for the individual. And so this, uh, this essay was written to respond to that trend. And uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson um, was an extensive journal writer. So he drew the ideas for this essay from his own personal journals, from uh, sermons and lectures he had delivered um, over the course of his lifetime. And so some of the material here dates way back uh, to the 1830s. So um, he's drawing on a lot of different things. Um, there is a way to organize the reading so that it makes a little bit more sense. There are 50 paragraphs total. Paragraphs uh, 1 through 17 are all about the importance of self-reliance. And then uh, paragraphs 18 to 32 deal with uh, self-reliance in the individual. And then the remaining paragraphs 33 through 50 deal with uh, self-reliance in society. So if you've printed this out, sometimes it helps to just make a, a mark between the different paragraphs so that you understand that these are different sections um, dealing with different things. Um, and the overall thesis or the overall theme or the point is to say that self-reliance is a virtue right? It is the ideal. And we should be, um, we should be self-reliant. We shouldn't rely on the government. We shouldn't rely on others to establish or determine what is right or wrong, good or bad. And so that is what this is about. And uh, we're going to go piece by piece through some of these paragraphs just to point out some, some cool phrases, some cool things that I think are cool. Um, you have an, a, a project to do where you're going to pull out things that you think are cool. Um, but uh, it's a great it's a great text, especially now um, in in our time where we do we're sort of moving to that reliance on others to tell us what's right or wrong, to tell us you know where we when we should go out or where we should go when we go out or what we should wear or what the standard of beauty is, things like that. So um, you know this this piece is timeless because we sort of do rely on others to determine what we think is right or wrong or good or bad. So uh, let's get started. The way that I'm doing this video is I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually doing it live as I'm rereading this. This is one of my most favorite pieces of literature, so I enjoy reading it over and over. I'm sure you don't. Um, so in this first paragraph, um, Emerson says, I read the other day some verses written by an eminent painter, which were original, but not conventional, right? And and so he he starts off by saying, you know, you know, this great person said this great thing, and you know, and I read it, and then in this paragraph he goes on to say, you know, when you have a great thought, it doesn't matter if you're a great painter or a great, you know, actor, you know, you have a great idea that's a great thought, and you're entitled to say it, you know. But we don't. We think, well, I'm I'm not. I'm not a famous actor. I'm not Keanu Reeves, so I, I can't say this important thing. And so you kind of keep it to yourself. And, and we wait for somebody who is who we think important to say say the important thing. And then we have to be like, well, I thought of that. I, I, I thought that. And we can see that, right? Like we can see that even like when we look at um, where we take advice from, you know, 
musicians, actors are always weighing in on political things. And, uh, and we think, oh, you know, well, you know, Bill, Will Smith said such and such or, or, you know, I don't know, Bob Marley said blah, 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 right? So we're always looking to them to, to, to be the saints and sages, but their ideas may be ideas that we've already had. So what Emerson is saying is, you know, you're good enough. You're great enough on your own. You can go ahead and say it and pronounce it to the world. You know, have your statement and say your statement and be proud of it. Don't wait for others to say it. So um, in the second paragraph, he says, there's a time in every man's education where he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, and that he must take for himself, for better or worse, as his portion, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him, but through his toil bestowed on the plot of ground which is given to him to till. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, that's a whole lot of words. But what that means is, you know, you are all students right now, right? And and each semester you have classes where you're given information. And uh, some of you are going to be nurses. I know we have some nurses in here. I always have lots of nurses. You know, and, and you know that when you get into nursing, when you become nurses, what's going to come back to you are the things that you learned about patient care, right? And you're probably not going to think about American romantics when you're, you know, when you're drawing blood or you're giving medicine, right? But what he's saying is that until you know what you need in any given situation, you don't know that. But then when it comes time, only you can apply that knowledge, right? So while well, maybe American Romantics isn't going to help you in an operating room, the spirit of humanity or loving humanity or understanding the human condition, which is what literature does, that will help you because you will think to yourself, okay, well, I'm dealing with this patient who may have this different worldview than I have, and um, I may not agree with him or her, but they have the right to have that worldview and and I can respect that person's worldview and I, I'm not going to, you know, contract it like a disease, right? So I can treat the individual because I understand more about humanity and I understand all the participants of humanity. And so, um, so your education, which, you know, I've worked in higher ed my whole life, uh, save a few years when I was a missionary teacher and I worked in a, in a high school, um, you take with you what is important, but you have to plant the seed. I can give you the seeds. Your other teachers can give you your seeds. They, your professors, they will give you corn, but you have to plant it if you want it to grow. And so you decide, you know, what's worth it and what's not. And what he says next is you can trust yourself. You can trust yourself. You can trust yourself. You don't have to rely on all these other people. You alone are smart enough and good enough that you can trust yourself with your ideas, right? Um, which is really a very conflicting message, right? Because we get magazines, or and not anymore, right? We don't get paper, but on the internet, we see you know pictures of these amazing people who are beautiful, and they are you know so well spoken, and they're gorgeous, and they're photoshopped, right? Nobody actually looks that great all the time. Photoshop and you know um, being able to edit video so that people sound smart or don't sound smart, you know. We have always had a culture where we've said this is perfection and then we're going to sell you products that make you that. And unfortunately, you can buy all the products and you're not going to be that because that wasn't real in the first place. And you think about, um, think about, you know, I love photography, so I take a lot of photos and I edit them so that they look better. But it isn't a true capture of that first thing that I took a picture of because I've, you know, I've changed the hue or I've changed the lighting a little bit or I've hidden the shadows or I brought out the black point, right? So, you know, even, even in simple things like photography, you know, we change it so that it matches a more perfect idea of what we want it to look like. Thoreau, uh, Emerson is saying you don't have to do that. 
right? The original idea, that's good enough, right? Um, so as you read on, you're going to read a lot of different uh, examples that he gives of, um, of, of times and places where, you know, other people have spoken and, and um, it would have been okay for, you know, a person to speak on their own. Um, so, and he talks about voice and your voice. What is your voice? So there are voices which we hear in solitude, but they grow faint and inaudible as we enter into the world. And doesn't that like really happen, right? So you might be thinking at home in the shower, you're thinking about something, but then you go out in the world and you hear everybody else's opinion. You're like, oh, well, you know, maybe, hmm, maybe I shouldn't think that. Maybe I, I should think this. And, and election time is always a really good example of this, right? I belong to a third party. So I get to see both parties fight with each other and carry on. And it's like, whoo, you know, they're kind of saying the same things, but they're just name calling the other side. Um, and so he says, society everywhere is in conspiracy against the manhood of every one of its members. And by manhood, he means humanhood, right? And, you know, like we, we listen to all these voices and then we kind of become afraid of our own voice, you know, in, in, that, in that loud clamoring noise. So the virtue in most requests is conformity, right? And we see that, like we, we educate our children, you know, we take them to school, they line up in a line, they go in the door, they go to their classes, they go to lunch at a certain time. We train people right from the beginning to conform to a standard. And, you know, anarchy would ensue if we didn't have some sort of, right? But what is the balance? You know, what is the balance at what point is conformity too much? And what at what point is it necessary? Um, whoso would be a man must be a nonconformist. So, and of course he means human. Um, and, you know, just remember when this was written, you know, they didn't have politically correct speech. So he's not, he's, he, he was actually very much a supporter of women's rights and very influential in the life of Louisa May Alcott, who never married um, and wrote uh, prolifically and, and loved, and loved um, Hawthorne. So, I'm um, sorry. Emerson. <laughs> I read all this stuff so much I get their names. So, um, so you know, don't get caught up in, in the gender uh, spe specific words that he uses because PC wasn't a thing. So <clears throat> he goes on to talk about how nothing is at last sacred but the integrity of your own mind. You alone have it in you to say amazing things, to think amazing thoughts. You just have to trust that you can rely on yourself. And there are so many voices that are going to tell you that that's not true. But think about why they're telling you that's not true. They want you to buy something. They want you to be on their side. They want you to vote for their party or their candidate. They want you to do something uh, to get on their team. And what he's advising us to do is to get rid of all that noise and rely on ourselves and our own thoughts, do our own research, think about life in our own ways. And of course, he gives more examples. Um, your assignment is going to be to look through this whole document and find these little nuggets. I call them, um, back in the olden days, Padawan, people used to put bumper stickers on their cars. And I call them bumper sticker statements. There's a lot of really good bumper sticker statements here. Um, you know, what I must do is all that concerns me, not what people think, right? Like we, we always say that, like, I don't care what people think, but you know, the truth is we do. We do care what people think. And so um, he's an, encouraging us not to think about that. So keep on reading. Um, such great stuff in here. And then uh, he says, he does recognize that, that our nature is to care about what other people say. And he says, I suppose no man can violate his nature. Um, you know, so he does recognize that, you know, at some level, you know, we, we need acceptance to be, you know, part of the human, you know, experience. Um, but for as much as is possible, we should be nonconformists. And then he talks about, I hope in these last days we've uh, heard the last of conformity and consistency. And that would be interesting to think about today, right? Especially given our current political climate, given covid and how things have shaken down. I mean, we are living in the time of a plague and the aftermath of a plague, right? So um, compared to the bubonic plague, right? You know, where there was 
less communication and, you know, less reliable medicine, um, you know, how are we handling it? How are, how are we, you know, how are we responding to one another about how we think about it, right? So you continue on, you're going to find some really good nuggets. I, I do recommend breaking this up into the three sections I told you and reading each section at a time, uh, just because it is longer. Remember, there's no TV or YouTube, so uh, people like to listen to lectures and like to read. Um, and, and he talks about the spirit of man, humankind. Man is timid and apologetic. He's no longer upright. He dares not say, I think I am, but quote some saint or sage. And that really is sort of the kernel of this piece is that we rely on others, whoever the others are, priests, pastors, teachers, doctors, politicians, actors, athletes, we rely on others and quote them instead of quoting ourselves. Even now, ironically so, I am quoting him as saying amazing things, right? So even I'm doing that right now and teaching this material. Um, but uh, over the course of the semester, you'll get lots of my opinions and feelings about things. Um, and and uh, and then you'll have the right and the opportunity to say your opinions and your feelings about things. So, um, and again, like I've said before, you should never be afraid to share your opinion with me as long as you back up what, what you're saying with, um, you know, you know, with a good, a good position, I will be um, eager to read it. So... You're going to continue reading. Lots of great stuff here. Lots and lots of great stuff. We're going to go to... <clears throat> he, has, he, like, lays out what, um, like, religion and art and things like that, what people should do. And it's interesting, given his own background and given his own... Um, his own... He was a, a minister... So, um, and then he walked away from the church. So that's, that's interesting. So when you go down to the bottom, let's look at this last paragraph. So use all that is called fortune. Most men gamble with her and gain all and lose all as her wheel rolls. But do thou leave and unlawful these winnings and deal with cause and effect the chancellors of God. In the will work and acquire and thou hast chained the wheel of chance and shall sit hereafter out of fear from her rotations. A political victory, a rise of rents, the recovery of your sick, or the return of your absent friend, or some other favorable event, raises your spirits, and you think good days are preparing for you. Do not believe it. Nothing can bring you peace but yourself. Nothing can bring you peace but the triumph of principles. And that is how he ends the work. You know, um, every day is going to bring you different things, but only you can bring yourself peace. And you bring your peace to yourself by relying on your own self, relying on your own principles, and establishing your own <clears throat> thoughts and feelings about the world. All right, so this is your first, uh, you know, uh, Emerson reading. He is uh, by far one of my most favorite writers, and I hope you enjoy him too.